Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Tom Stevens of Tombot. I am, I got to say, folks, I'm actually kind of giddy about this. When I saw this come across my desk and I looked at this website, I was like, oh, my goodness, I got to get this. I got to get this product on the show. But before we get into all that, Tom, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us a little background, career journey, any personal experiences that have helped shape your entrepreneurial journey. You bet. Thank you so much for having me, Gabriel. It's really a treat to be here. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Tom Stevens. I'm CEO and co-founder of TomBot. And this is Jenny. Jenny is a fully interactive robotic emotional support animal. And she'll be the first to be both an FDA medical device and a remote safety and health monitoring platform. So lots to share about Jenny and yeah, you'll get a chance to talk. Uh, uh, my background is I've been in the high-tech industry for 35 years. My two Tombot co-founders and I built a prior startup into one of the world's largest litigation automation companies. We were successfully acquired in 2011, wow. which gave me the freedom to think about other things. Unfortunately, that same year, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia, and that started a string of really difficult uh, interactions uh, for us. Uh, the first was having to move in a full-time caregiver. Uh, she hated that. Uh, the second was taking away her car keys, so now she had to ask permission to go anywhere. Uh, but lastly, and, and by far the worst, was the day I realized that I had to take away her dog for safety reasons. Um, the good news is the dog's still enjoying a, uh, a wonderful home with a new family, but my mother was devastated and angry. Yeah. Every day it was, where's my dog? Why can't I have my dog? When am I getting my dog back? And it destroyed our relationship. Uh, I went from being the the golden boy son to being the villain in her life. So uh, I started looking around for substitutes for live animal companions. Uh, she hated everything that I brought home. Uh, so I realized that there might be a gap in the marketplace. That launched me on a multi-year research and education journey, which culminated in a master's degree from Stanford University. Uh, and along the way, I learned that my mom's story is shared by tens of millions of other seniors with dementia around the world, and about a billion people in total that suffer from some form of serious mental health adversity. Many of these people, like my mom, cannot safely or practically care for a live animal. Uh, so we launched it, Tombot in 2017 to help these people. So so folks that are listening at home that may not be too familiar with if, if you're if you're just listening and not paying on the video, what Tombot is is actually a interactive. Maybe Tom, I'll let you explain it a little bit. You bet. Uh, so just a, uh, if I I'll give you a slightly longer explanation. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually a very well researched area. Over 150 peer reviewed studies done to date, uh, going back as many as 40 years, and they show that where a senior with dementia can form a robust emotional attachment to an object. Traditionally, that object has been uh, a human baby doll or a stuffed animal. Uh, that senior gets a great deal of relief from the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, loneliness, depression, anxiety, in my mother's case, hallucinations and violent anger. Yeah. And we also see a significant reduction in the need for psychotropic medications. Psychotropics include antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and antipsychotic medications. Um, and not only do are these medications, uh, you know, do they turn seniors into zombies, but uh, some of them, particularly the antipsychotics, uh, carry grave uh, health risks. Uh, uh, a study out of the Veterans Administration a few years ago found that as many as 25% of their seniors were actually killed by the antipsychotic medications. So wow. a huge need to find alternatives to these psychotropics. Um, but the problem is most seniors, including my mother, don't form the necessary emotional attachment to, uh, to the traditional objects. Research on robotic animals show they significantly outperform the traditional objects and have the added benefit of, of uh, 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 reducing pain 
and the need for pain medications. The problem there, however, is uh, 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 existing products are either simple children's toys, which have been rebranded re for seniors, which once again, few seniors enjoy, or on the other end of the spectrum, uh, are prohibitively expensive robots. Uh, this whole space was actually invented uh, by a company out of Japan called Paro, P-A-R-O. They make a robotic seal and it's an excellent robot, but it costs over $6,000. Most yeah. senior care facilities can't afford one, let alone the individuals who need one for themselves in order to form that uh, emotional bond. Uh, uh, so I was armed with all this information when I launched the company. And first thing I wanted to do was understand why any of uh, these objects worked uh, in the first place. And right. what I've learned is that they, they stimulate positive changes in the neurochemistry in the brain. Uh, it's a complex neurochemical cocktail, but what's thought to be hardest at work is oxytocin. Oxytocin has been shown to reduce stress, reduce anxiety, and reduce pain yep. because it interacts directly with our internal opioid system. Um, the human body naturally produces oxytocin. Uh, it's seen most commonly in a mother giving birth to a baby uh, or breastfeeding. It's shown in uh, parents bonding with adopted children so that that genetic connection is not necessary. And it's also been demonstrated with humans interacting with live animals. Uh, and most of the research there has been done with dogs. And so our challenge became uh, to develop a better emotional attachment object, one that would consistently stimulate those positive changes in the neurochemistry, but would be at a, uh, available at a price that most people could afford even without healthcare reimbursements. Yeah. So we developed, we conducted uh, multiple rounds of customer studies, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, product market fit, I think. Yep. Uh, yep. But we conducted multiple rounds of customer studies with over 700 seniors with dementia, uh, developing different prototypes. Uh, uh, in the first study, we, uh, we were able to affirm the hypothesis that seniors would prefer objects that move over objects that don't move. In the second study, uh, we were able to confirm that, uh, that seniors preferred uh, objects that, uh, first of all, were um, uh, uh, familiar to them. So dogs and cats as opposed to wild animals or fictitious creatures. And in the third study, we were able to demonstrate that, uh, uh, confirm the hypothesis that seniors would prefer greater levels of realism as opposed to toy-like or cartoon-like uh, or stuffed animal-like uh, shapes. Um, we reached out uh, to, for help with this to the animatronics community in Hollywood and teamed up with Jim Henson's Creature Shop, the people behind the Muppets and Sesame yeah, Street, yeah. and a great many very realistic uh, props for uh, TV and film. And with their help doing our artistic design, we tested what you're seeing in front of you now, which is Jenny, which is what we believe to be the world's most realistic robotic animal. We like to call her Kermit the Frog's youngest sister. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, scientifically designed to stimulate uh, through behaviors and, and appearance, the, the, uh, 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 the emotional attachment. And then once that emotional attachment's in place, we become a unique platform for monitoring that senior for safety and health. So with that very long windup, uh, she is an eight, modeled after an eight to 10 week old uh, Labrador retriever puppy. This one is uh, has the yellow fur on it, but she'll be available ultimately in all the natural colors that Labradors come in, which include black chocolate and a pale chocolate uh, uh, that looks like silver, uh, very similar to the Weimarander dog that blue gray uh yep. color um and uh, uh and she's fully interactive so uh like any of us uh she has a sensory system uh she can feel how and where she's being touched she can understand uh, she can hear us talking and understands voice commands she can feel herself being moved and a variety of other sensors to try to understand her environment make an inference about what's happening in her environment, and then exhibit a behavior that is consistent with that environment, 
without ever showing repetition of behaviors. Yeah, so folks, again, just to just to make sure we got this clear, we have a robotic dog and it looks just like a dog. It, it, it's, it's moving its head, it's wagging its tail, it's, it's doing all the dog things. In the back, you might've heard it in the background, uh, barking a little bit. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It's so <laughs> cool. Now, Tom, let's let's take a step back for, uh, for a minute. Let's go back to the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. What motivated you to get into entrepreneurship? Uh, uh, I didn't set out to be, to do this. Um, uh, so I had the, I had the, the, the great luck, uh, and it really is nothing more than that of, of falling into the computer industry when it was brand new, the personal computer industry was brand new in the eighties. Uh, you know, before Microsoft was a household name before any of right, that right. world was a household name. Um, and at that time, uh, uh, the, the industry was going through explosive growth, which meant that anybody who had a pulse could not only get a job in the uh, in the computer industry, what but would be quickly promoted beyond their own competency. Uh, and so, <laughs> like so many others, that that described my journey. And I, I turned around after being in the uh, the industry for several years and realized that I I had a lid on my. Uh, uh, on my uh, future development, I was uh, in terms of career progress. I was working for a company called Novell at the time. The uh, company made uh, what was then the leading network operating system software, very technical uh, uh, product, uh, which was really good for me um, to learn. Um, but I was at a director level in the company and, and I was uh, in my 20s and there was no way. Uh, they should have promoted me beyond that. So I realized that was gonna be my path for the next decade or more. Um, and I was recruited uh, uh, by some good friends to join a fledgling company, a startup company that was doing the Novell network operating systems in the legal vertical. And basically what I looked at that is, is a chance to, to make the leap over to a smaller company, actually be able to deliver some value that they might appreciate and uh, quite selfishly, potentially enjoy some upside if the company performed. Um, up until that time, I was fairly risk adverse, but uh, but this was this was a bold leap, and uh, I was I had a young uh, young wife at the time, and we were we were kind of gung ho to give it a try. So so I did, um, and that company ultimately uh, evolved into a litigation specific vertical within the the legal, uh, and then we. Like the PC industry, uh, uh, just happened to be there at the time when email and other electronically stored information uh, uh, started blowing up uh, lawsuits among the big corporations. And right, the right. So we were we were well positioned to capitalize that opportunity and and, and grew it quite uh, quite substantially. Um. Now, what you know, one of the things you mentioned um, again, you have a very unique product. Right. Uh, it, it's something that you have to find the right customer for. How do you gauge product market fit for products or services? Well, uh, it, it's a really important question, Gabriel, and I'm thrilled to be have a chance to talk about it because it's it, it, uh, it, like so many things in my career, I, I learned by doing things the wrong way. Uh, enough. <laughs> uh, I, I, I Don't actually, we all? Don't we? All. <laughs> I actually I actually started listening to other people after uh, after making enough mistakes as a headstrong youth and uh, uh, and became much more much more data driven. Uh, I I think the first uh, you know uh, uh, sort of product development one hundred and one or product marketing one hundred and one um, is to very narrowly define your customer. Uh, uh, general products for general products, for the most part, don't work. Don't don't because they don't please anybody. Um, uh, uh, you know the reason why we don't all drive pickup trucks, and and perhaps some of the listeners do drive pickup trucks. But the reason we don't all drive pickup trucks is because that's not that a pickup truck doesn't have customer uh, product market fit, customer fit for our needs and wants. So uh, even though it probably provides equally uh, capable transportation to, you know, a sports sedan or a sports car or a subcompact or, you know, SUV or what have you. Um, so first of all, very narrowly defining the customer and then finding a hair on fire problem 
that that customer has. They have to solve this problem today or their life is worse, whether that's a B2B sale or a B2C sale or a medical right. device in this case, have to define that problem and then see if you can come up with ways of solving that. You have to really understand the problem. You have to become an expert on that problem and then sort of take your own uh, opinions out of it. Uh, intuition is helpful, but it can misinform you too. Uh, and start testing things. Try to try to try to construct tests that are yeah. meant, to, meant to have a possibility of failing, right. uh, uh, because then you, then there's the, the risk associated with that gives you some confidence that if they succeed, there's actually uh, the data that's developed there is actually meaningful. Right. As I mentioned, um, I had an intuition uh, that replacing my dog, uh, my mother's dog, with a dog might be something she wanted, but I, right. I didn't allow that my partners didn't allow that uh, to really uh, cloud our judgment on how we approached identifying the customer problem. And then product, mar mar uh, product market fit, um, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways you can, you can define what that means, but uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, the venture capital firm out of Silicon Valley, you know, it's, it's having a product that your customer loves uh, in uh, in a really great market, you know, rapidly growing market where there's you know substantial opportunity. Well, love for us isn't love like you love your coffee maker, or you know, love like you love a favorite pair of shoes. Uh, this is literally love. Uh, in order for this product to work, the user has to fall in love with it, has to care about its well-being, has to look after it every single day like they would uh, a real animal. Uh, and so trying to, trying to be objective about uh, when we reach that level uh, of, uh, of interaction and of interest uh, uh, was important. And then, and then minimum, pro uh, minimum viable product. This product mm -hmm. could have been far more sophisticated than it was and have far more cost. But if it's, any, if it's a dollar more of technology beyond a minimum viable product, then that's a dollar of cost that your customers don't don't value, and it makes you vulnerable to somebody else coming out with what's truly a minimum viable product at a price that you can't afford to compete with. That, that that's a very great point, very good point. In fact, you know what I think that's very interesting about your story is you really took your own personal experience and, and turned it into a profitable business venture. Let's talk about that. How did you take your personal experience and turn it into a business? Well, I was fortunate that I had the financial freedom to take a few years off and uh, and and not go, you know, jump, you know, either continue with the company and it, with its with its acquirer. Actually, I stuck around for a year, but I didn't have to continue beyond that. Um, so it it really left me wondering what I should do, and it was it was a personal journey uh, as much, uh, or if not more, than it was a professional journey. Um, uh, and I will, I will say one thing that I realized in the process, I didn't necessarily realize it from day one, um, was that, that you don't have a personal stake in, in succeeding. Yep. If you don't have that level of passion uh, to yeah. get you out of bed and work seven days a week and, and endure all of the stress and anxiety uh, and setbacks uh, that you will undoubtedly go through, um, you probably won't see it through. Uh, you probably will not have the resilience uh, uh, to see this through. Solving my mom's problem uh, uh, and quite selfishly saving our relationship was a substantial motivation. Uh, yeah. I also, also just became really curious about this. I became curious about, um, first of all, I thought it was just my crazy mom. Uh, and so when I, <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I say that, I say that now, uh, uh, my mom was always sort of an eclectic person, um, but she was, she was a special education teacher, the kind okay. of person who would do anything yeah. to anybody without, uh, without, you know, hesitation. She was also the kind of person that would expect that anybody would do anything for her without hesitation too. So kind of lived in an unusual uh, <laughs> world growing up, but it informed a lot of my values uh, as well. Um, but when she changed, when the dementia, the Alzheimer's changed her personality, when she became mean, nasty, vindictive, and, and directing that all at me, uh, it was substantial motivation uh, uh, 
to, to see if I could make her life better. Yeah. What would you say has been the most enjoyable part about your entrepreneurial journey? Well, the, the easy part of that, uh, and I, I can separate my previous company from our current company. I was just talking about my current company, Tom bought and Jenny, I'm, I'm boring her. She's going to go. Yeah, <laughs> she just. <laughs> uh, I, I, without question, customer interaction. Mm, uh, yeah. Not just from the process, you know, the, the very purposeful process of getting the voice of the customer, that that's critical, um, that the, the customer tells you what their problems are, um, but just seeing how appreciative people are that you're giving, paying any attention to them at all. Uh, seniors with dementia, uh, for the most part, um, is an ignored space from a technology standpoint. Uh, technology that exists today is more on the diagnostic front. Uh, innovation is more on the diagnostic front than on the therapeutic front, actually treating people for this. So uh, the seniors are so, so appreciative um, that actually getting people to participate with customer studies was effortless. Um, we talked to a few senior care professionals, they talked to a few senior care professionals, and suddenly we had over 700 seniors, you know, chomping at the bit uh, yeah. uh, to help us with our study. So that's every day I get a chance to interact, whether it's through email or Zoom calls like this, or, uh, you know, before and after the pandemic's worst uh, times yeah. uh, uh, during those in person. Uh, and without question, absolutely the most enjoyable. Just a quick anecdote. Uh, we're working with one of the nation's largest uh, skilled nursing facility operators, um, doing some studies with them. And, you know, you come in the front door, I have to walk down a relatively short hallway, you know, 100 foot long hallway to get to a meeting room. It took me 15 minutes because I'm Is stopped <laughs> by somebody whether it's a visitor or a staff member or a resident there who just has to know uh, about this. So, so that it's just fun and it's enjoyable and it's rewarding and the potential to do good there really, really feeds a, a yeah. through difficult times. And, and I get it. I agree. You know, I, I work in the healthcare industry and, and we see the value of pet therapies. In fact, we have several pets um, that come through our hospital and, and they have their own name badges as well. And they go through the go through the rooms, the, the pediatric hospital and the adult hospital, because uh, healthcare is challenging. And, and especially, you know, the Alzheimer's disease, uh, it's, it's that disease in particular is such a difficult disease. Um, and I know we're making strides uh, every day uh, to kind of help support that community. But to your point, that's a that's a community that sometimes is neglected uh, a lot. In fact, it, sometimes patients with illnesses in general uh, are tend to be neglected because of this this um, invisible stigma we have on, on things we don't know. Right? We were very cautious. Uh, we're very cautious creatures. Now. What are some of the, you know, obviously entrepreneurship comes with its fair share of challenges. Uh, can you give us some significant hurdles that you've encountered either in your previous entrepreneurial journey or this one maybe as well? Well, I, I, so I, I, will, I will make a quick point and park that and we can come back to it uh, as well. But uh, nobody is immune to macroeconomic forces. Uh, the, 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 Very good point. The biggest setbacks that my previous company endured were macroeconomic. They weren't okay. customer, they weren't technical. They weren't mismanagement, although I'm sure there's plenty of that. It was it was uh, it was macroeconomic and understanding that that is going to happen because the business cycle is a normal recurring event um, and preparing for that even when times are really good. Uh, is is critical for survival of your company because you can have a company that's absolutely blowing up, you know, today and then twelve months from now is completely upside down and, yeah. and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. So, so being thought being, I've lived through enough of these business cycles. Although I haven't been, you know, it's been uh, less since two thousand eight. There's really only been the pandemic one. Uh, uh, it's. It, it will impact you. Uh, there's nothing uh, you can do to prevent macroeconomic events, uh, but you can take actions to uh, mitigate the risk. Um, but speaking with this company, um, this is the easiest product I've ever been uh, uh, involved with in my life to sell. It's a dog, right? So people, people yeah, and 
that you know it's a dog and the dogs are good and fun and interesting and and so there's there really isn't much of a barrier much of a pushback you know some people will say oh what about the ai and things like that but you know we're we're very thoughtful about the ethics uh, of all of this uh, um, so it sales wise it's really not that big of a risk fundraising has been uh unbelievably difficult without question the the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. Uh, and the reason is, and this is for all of you uh, budding entrepreneurs uh, to know, I went into it quite naively. I think, hey, I built a big business before, huge success. I brought my partners from that business into this new one. Uh, we know what we're doing. It's a great idea. The customers are really into it. Surely fundraising is going to be a straightforward right. process. Uh, I, I was so naive. Um, uh, first of all, 90 plus percent of institutional investors, 90 plus percent will not invest in hardware under any circumstances ever. Oh, so, uh, so if you need funding, and it'll take about $10 million to bring this product entire, uh, all the way to market, uh, it's capital intensive to bring a robot to market. Really? Um, Where's that $10 million going to come from yeah. if not from institutional investors? The, the, the single digits of the institutional investors that will invest in hardware uh, or robotics, uh, even higher bar, um, generally will not invest in them prior to first customer shipment. So, oh, interesting. So, uh, you know, every company that succeeds goes through a growth trajectory, a valuation trajectory that looks like a hockey stick. You know, you've got this fairly it was hockey stick laying on the ground. Right. You have this, you have this fairly flat period while you're traversing the handle and then you get to the blade of the hockey stick and then you get this inflection point and you go almost straight up. Uh, institutional investors have been trained to wait till you get to the blade and, and mm. not at the beginning of the blade, well on to the blade. They would rather right. pay 10 times the share price for a company that you know could give them 10x to, to 50x returns then pay earlier potentially passing up 100x or 1000x returns but also have a substantial risk that you actually never bring the product to market so okay. uh it's a uh, it's been a real challenge uh to get people on board we've had some luck there but it's it, it has shortened my life without uh, exaggerating <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to raise the funds uh, to keep this company going, and, and let's let's talk about that a little bit. How how let's walk us through the strategies and efforts you employed to build and establish this brand. Well, I, I had the good fortune of uh, doing my master's at, at in the Stanford Business School, and they, I, prior to that point in my career, so why did I do that? Um, first of all, I, I needed to learn a lot more about robotics and AI and animation and things like that. And that school's um, great. The IDEO School at Stanford's phenomenal. Yeah, uh, but more than that, I was fearful because I, I kind of have this risk adverse uh, personality. Um, I was fearful that even though I could lead a company in the litigation automation space, did I have the breadth of uh, of education, of training uh, yeah. to lead a company in a completely different industry? Uh, even though robots are computers that move and I've been in computers, it's different enough. Uh, right. uh, and, and, and coming into the healthcare space was, was different still. Um, so so going, through, going through Stanford, one of the wonderful things at Stanford is they have a lot of experiential uh, programs. It's not unique to Stanford. Lots of other um, schools offer the same. Where you, as, uh, as at a minimum, an academic exercise can run a startup while you're going to school. And the, 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 the two benefits to that, uh, first of all, were... Um, uh, that you learn, you know, the sort of the ABCs of things that you have to have put in place at the very earliest stages of the company. Um, but it also turned me into a better selective listener for the education that I did go through. So every class I went through, whether it was finance or animation or, uh, uh, or accounting or, or macroeconomics, uh, macroeconomics, whatever it was that I was taking at a given time, I selectively listened for information that was relevant to a startup company. And it really, it really, I think I got far more out of the education than I would have otherwise. Um, so uh, I want to make sure I stay on the thread of your, uh, uh, your question. 
Uh, I one one more point, and I hope I'm addressing it. Uh, yeah. Getting a little, a little stuff to stay on. <laughs> uh, uh, probably the one piece of advice that I got that has been better than any other piece of advice uh, in terms of organizing yourself uh, to start the company is first thing you want to do is create a pitch deck for investors. And pitch decks are fairly standardized today. Now ours is probably longer and and uh, and more boring than pitch decks that other people should bring out. But but the standard questions that you have to anticipate investors asking and therefore have to have content in a pitch deck are exactly the strategic conversations that you should be asking yourself about your business. You know. Uh, you know, what's the market size? What's it? Uh, what's how are you going to get to market? What are all the engineering risks? Uh, what are the financial risks? Who are the competitors? Uh, uh, you know, it it, it it goes on and on and on. And I can talk about, you know, the ABCs of pitch decks, but there are plenty of re resources out there for sample investor pitch decks that just starting there is, is more than good enough. But it, 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 it caused me to change my behavior and focus on things that were not just product centric, uh, but really business centric. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, I had to have investors that had confidence, not only in the team and the product, but the company's viability to return an investment. You know, what's your exit strategy? You know, things like that. Well, I'm gonna run the company, we're gonna make money. No, you gotta have an exit strategy. So, um, uh, uh, so understanding the the fears and needs of investors and creating a pitch deck and, and answering all those questions was a tremendous exercise. And and you can do it before you have a, you know, before you commit to a real company. You know, you say, just do it as an exercise. Because uh, if, if, if you can kill your company by not successfully answering those questions, you can bet an investor can. Uh, yeah. Very, very great point. You know, and that's, that's, it's true. One of the things you mentioned too is, is AI, right? One, AI, that something that starting to come up often. In fact, I had a guest recently to talk about AI too. There's room for AI in every industry. How has TomBots leveraged AI's algorithms? Yeah, it's great, great point. Obviously, AI, if you're if you're thinking about going into a business today, that's kind of where you want to be. If, yep. if you want to start a business that is going to attract investors' attention, uh, attention as your first goal, and you get, okay, within this world, where do I find per things I care about personally? It's probably a good idea to first of all, get into software and do something that's related to AI. Because um, uh, there's a, a, all, most of the money today in the investor world is going into AI, uh, AI types of startups. Um, so AI, AI is, uh, obviously it stands for artificial intelligence. It's not, um, it's not used correctly. Uh, technically speaking, it's not used correctly. Uh, uh, AI is sort of a dream. Uh, artificial intelligence is sort of a dream. It's a very long way off. Uh, but machine learning, deep learning, which are the tools that underpin artificial uh, intelligence, are, are those tools are mature today and are very applicable to uh, to anything. But when you think about machine learning or deep learning, you're not thinking about building a brain that can do a myriad of different things. You're thinking about unique tasks. For example, facial recognition. Facial recognition isn't creating a smart entity that can, hey, I met you before I recognize you again, but rather is comparing your face to a whole lot of other faces and saying, have I seen you again? Yes, I have, you're in this category. Uh, 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 natural language processing, uh, which is a lot about what chat, uh, uh, GPT can do, uh, text, uh, text, uh, uh, text uh, 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 cognitive capabilities. Yep. That's a lot of what we're doing. And so it, it's AI is focused, if we can use that, that term uh, broadly, is really focused about doing very specific tasks. And so in our robot, we're using, uh, we're using it with our first, our, our minimum viable product, rules-based algorithms to be able to uh, uh, make inferences about things. And then after it's run through a calculation about what this combination of uh, inputs mean, and then says, therefore, and then exhibits a behavior in a particular category of behaviors. Uh, 
but uh, ultimately uh, machine learning, deep learning will be used uh, or are being used for things like balance control. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, emotional, emotion detection, uh, yep. gait recognition. So, so just an incredible uh, number of applications for these that will be different tools on the tool belt of what gives the robot the ability to understand its environment. But it, uh, the idea that the robot has this sort of central core that really gets it yeah. is, is, is so far off that it's, it's, it's sort of beyond even you know, to sit around and thinking about. Yeah. You know, one, one of the former guests, one of the things he mentioned, which I was like, yes, thank you. Uh, for example, AI has solved math. So if you're a teacher out there and you're, if you're tr teaching long division, long multiplication, the Pythagorean, stop, stop, stop teaching us the Pythagorean theorem. I do not care if the division or the plus or the minus or what comes before, if it's a positive, I do not care, but you know what I care about more than anything. And I want these kids to learn more than anything. Excel, teach them how to use Excel because guess what? AI has solved math. It's called Excel. You can put any formula you want. I don't need to know how to do it. I don't need to know that the multiple comes before the positive. I, I don't care. I don't care. Teach me the formula that I need to know to figure it out. I don't need to know the backgrounds. I need to, I don't need to know the entire algorithm. I just need to know how to get to the solution. And that's that's really what AI is helping us do. It's it's helping us push forward. And so when folks are using chat, chat GPT to write a novel, um, sure, use it, but it's there for a guideline. Don't use it word for word. Go through that. Use your own edits. Make sure that your own voice is added to those blogs or newsletters or whatever content you're creating. It's just there to kind of help you be a guide rail. Uh, but at the end of the day, it can't do the task that you're going to do, right? It's, it still can't do, it still can't go pump my gas yet, right? It still can't make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? It can do tasks. It can do tasks, but it can't do the job. So uh, just just be mindful of that because I always see like folks like with AI is like it's gonna take over my job. It's, it won't take your job. It'll take over tasks that you do in your job, which is great because it allows me more time to do other things, right? Well, and and that's such a great point, Gabriel. So I've been around long enough to see the uh, the migration from the typing pool in the office environment to. Them using word processors to the yes, good, great point. Being on the desk of the executive and and she or he generating their own first drafts of uh, uh, of, of you know polished documents. Um, nobody is nobody is longing for bringing the typing pool back. You know, so it's some job <laughs> some job becomes superfluous, but what it does is allows people to move into higher value situations. Right. And, and as you say. Uh, uh, no, uh, writing the book is a great example. Uh, G Chat GPT can write a book, but it can't write a good book. You know, right. Use it as a grammar checker. Use it as initial ideas. Uh, we use it in software uh, coding, but I guarantee you there are going to be some horrific uh, mistakes that are yep. there. You've got to have the understanding of, uh, in which to find those things. So it's it's another way to accelerate things, but I agree that we're not looking at wholesale uh, workforce displacement. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's a great, great point too, Tom, like use chat TPT as an editor. In fact, I do this often. I write blog posts, uh, shout out to my wife who used to edit my blogs all the time, no longer has to, because thankfully chat TPT does it for me, but yeah, you know, use it, use it for a, a, a source of creating a better you, but don't use it to be you. Right. Uh, because you still have to have your own personal, um, branding to it. Now, now, Tom, what advice, you know, you've, you've, been in through the entrepreneurial world for some time what valuable uh, so with your valuable experience what advice or tips would you give our listeners who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs or looking to start their own venture one day well i've already uh, thank you i you know, this could be the rest of our uh, our conversation so I'll, I'll try to restrain myself um uh we've already talked about having a having a problem that you're passionate about caring i'll, I'll say that that that's number one so what are two, three, four, um, uh, 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 solo entrepreneurs rarely succeed, unless you're talking about a small boutique business, but um, 
For those of you that are listening to this podcast, I suspect you may be listening for advice and ideas on how to build what's called a venture scale uh, type of business. Um, if you're going to go out and get institutional funding, how how will this business deliver the kind of returns that investors need in order to take the risk uh, on your investment? So how is it, the, the easy one is, how is this company going to be worth a billion dollars some, someday? How is it going to unicorn? Um, uh, so if if that's the if that's the world that you're li living in, um, doing it by yourself will probably not succeed uh, unless you've got some crazy capabilities and uh, unique knowledge about a, a, a niche space that is desperate for solutions. You probably need a team around you. And uh, once again, I'm old enough to have learned that anybody who has great strengths also has great weaknesses. Um, find teammates that aren't exactly like you. Uh, you don't want two or three or four people with the same great strengths and the same great weaknesses. Put, put people together that are complementary to each other. And you know the easy place to start there is, is organizing yourself into the, the different silos, silos like I handle uh, all the marketing, I ultimately handle all the sales, I'm the chief financial officer, the CEO sort of have the, the outward face to the company. Um, I have a chief operating officer who wants none of that, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but is, is so much better than I am at management and details and, and getting things done on time. And uh, our third member, our chief technology officer, wants neither of those yeah, uh, very good responsibility, point. but is, is an inventor and is a, a, a curious learner and is constantly pushing the envelope on 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 where the technology that could potentially be useful for us might come from and you know ai uh, again there so finding people that that are complementary to you um uh both from an expertise standpoint but also from a personality standpoint is really 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 critical it's not easy to do and i will tell you that with three people in our case um you will find a lot of reasons to disagree so uh, you know, surrounding your leadership team with an organizational culture that does really well with dispute resolution. Not like you've got to, you've got to talk people off the ledge every day, right. but, but be comfortable with difficult topics, have, yep. have mechanisms in place where those difficult topics don't become, you know, a, a point of discord uh, within the team. So, uh, everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to feel like they're contributing value. Um, getting defensive uh, about your points of view, uh, getting your feelings hurt, none of that's helpful uh, yep. in these environments. And every startup, uh, no matter how well-funded it is or how good this founding team is or how experienced you're going to have, is going to be in a pressure cooker, uh, which means that every little thing that goes wrong is going to have outsized importance to you until your company is stable at some point, and really stable at some point in the future. Uh, one of the um, uh, one of the uh, one of the courses I took at Stanford had as a guest lecturer one of the co-founders of Trulia, uh, the uh, uh, the real estate uh, uh, online program. Uh, and he said, people are always coming up to me going, wow, you guys had this amazing success. This must have been the best journey ever. And, you know, what was that like? And he said, I don't know where people get that idea. Every <laughs> week, literally every week, there was a near death experience. <laughs> and that's the company that blew up. You know, you will, I feel that every week. You yeah. will feel that every week. So how, how do you and your, your leadership team cope? with near-death experiences and and be resilient to work your way through it and it, it's uh, so so advice number one uh, pick a problem that you care about passionately advice number two find find two three four teammates that also care about that are very different people than you are can bring additional skills to your team and then thirdly wrap wrap a culture around this that enables you to succeed near-death experiences and other yeah. trying trials and tribulations because they are inevitable they will yeah i i gotta say my biggest talent is actually uh, uh working with smarter people smarter than me that that's basically my goal is to identify i, I know enough to be dangerous but i also know my limits 
right? And my, my, my zone of genius, right? And my versus my zone of competence. And uh, I got to tell you, and in regards to crucial conversations, uh, Tom, you mentioned, you know, having those crucial conversations. There's a great book, Crucial Conversations. It's actually utilized in healthcare often because, you know, we have to have very crucial conversations. And same with the business world. I think um, understanding how to have those conversations. And, and to your point, uh, talking to the problem, not not talking to the person as being the problem, right? To focus on the problem as being the, and find a solution to the problem. Don't make the other people around it be the problem. So Tom, thank you. Very, very good information. Great advice. Now for the folks at home that want to learn more about you, maybe they'll want to connect with you online. Maybe they want to find you. Where can they find more information about you? Well, the easiest place to go is tombot.com, T-O-M-B-O-T.com. You'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of information about Jenny there. You'll see videos uh, and testimonials and the media coverage that we've enjoyed. You'll see my mom. Uh, I love it. And uh, in one of the early prototypes that she tested with uh, uh, there online. Uh, and then, of course, from there, we've got all the normal social media uh, handles. You can get to them through our, our landing page on our website. We have a ton of inform. If you're interested in this from a personal standpoint, and lots of people are affected yep. by mental health, so I encourage you to learn that that companies like Tombot and not just Tombot exist, and there are there are solutions out there that can help you coping with mental health or hope, help a loved one coping yeah. with mental adversities. Uh, we have a number of interviews that are on our our YouTube channel with experts that that really aren't talking about selling Tombot. They're really talking about what they do and the problems right. that they solve and the challenges that they run into and, and uh, a lot of a lot of wonderful advice uh, from experts, from families. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to browse through that. Love it. And so folks, for, the, for those folks that are listening, this is actually a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter because this information will be on the newsletter. To subscribe to the newsletter, please visit theshadesofe.com. You can also follow me at the Shades of E on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Tom, thank you again so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Very, very cool. Uh, very cool thing um, that the dog, I mean, it's just so, so neat. So neat. <laughs> I can't even begin to explain it. So folks, I really hope you uh, enjoy this episode and please take a moment to check out Tom Bots. Uh, thank you again and have a great night.